there, everybody. And thank you all so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, I'm not causing all this trouble by myself. I'm joined by me and Miguel. Big Fizzy. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios. It's a dreary oh. and rainy day, but I'm here. <laughs> And I want to first off uh, thank everyone uh, that's reached out to make sure that we survived. Uh, there was a tornado that hit our town. It was a little wild. If you go on Facebook, you can just search up Weatherford, Texas, and look for some any, any re- recent photos, and you'll see pictures of the tornado. You'll, what you'll see is the courthouse with the tornado in it. Now, my office is on <laughs> the square, so it's literally you were looking next that direction. to the courthouse. So let me tell you the story. And here's the best part, before you go any further, where the tail of that tornado is, is pretty much right above our houses. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm at work. I'm at my office. My office is upstairs in a, like a commercial front. Imagine a town square. So the bottom floor is like, a, there's a restaurant there. There's an olive oil store there. There's a couple lawyers, things like that. Right And Caddy Corner to me is a pharmacy. I'm in an office upstairs. Now my office, because I have my own company, I just, it's just me. I work for myself, by myself. My office doesn't have any windows in it, just the way I like it, right? I can get in there and I can work and I don't have any distractions. Well, I was on the phone with Cam and you're like, dude, did you hear the sirens? Yeah. And I was like, I did hear them, but sometimes they test them, right? So I didn't think it was a big deal. Well, they're like, no, man, it's fixing to get really wild. And I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, man, I better get home because at my office, there's a parking uh, garage like awning thing but you could I didn't want my truck to get hailed on the car that I work out of I don't care if it gets hailed on right so I was like well I better drive home I only live like 10 minutes away from my office so I was like well I'm gonna go fly home pick up the truck bring the truck back to my office and put it underneath the awning so it doesn't get hailed on right so that's what I do I jump in the truck it's getting dark now the wind's starting to pick up but look I've lived in Texas my entire life so I've been through literally thousands of storms and more than a dozen tornadoes have been by me right so I'm kind of familiar I'm not that freaked out this is just an every springtime event if you're a north central Texan anyways I'm going to the house well Luke likes to hang out at my office no kids like to hang out at their dad's office I fly in the house. I grab the keys. I go, Luke, you want to go to the office with me? He's like, yeah. I tell my wife, hey, look, we're getting in the, we're getting in the truck. I'm going to the office. I'm going to hang out there till the storm blows over so it doesn't get hailed on. Perfect. Luke gets in the truck. We start driving back to the office. As we're driving to the office, the wind is picking up, and there's starting to be stuff blowing around. Now, again, I'm not that alarmed. You know, tornadoes are a lot different than hurricanes, where hurricane, the storm slowly builds, and then the eye of the storm that kind of calms down. Then as it passes, eye passes over, it starts building up again. Tornadoes, they can change quickly. So what I say, and literally without exaggeration, in three minutes, it went from kind of windy to where I was starting to think, oh, God, I might have messed up. I might have just brought me and Luke to the tornado. I fly in, I park under the awning, and as I'm doing that, Luke jumps out the other side of the pickup. I jump out the driver's side, and the wind picks up a piece of a gutter, part of an awning, and blows the roof completely off, right? Now, if that would have hit one of us, it would have been bad. I'm not saying it would have killed us, but it would have been bad. And the wind is really going out, so I start yelling, Luke, no answer. I'm like, it's stuff's blowing around, and it's getting wild. It's getting Western. I'm like, Luke. Now, for whatever reason, when Luke gets kind of scared, he just clams up. So I don't know if the wind done got him. I don't know if a piece of sheet metal hit Tornado him. Tornado done took him. Whatever. Finally, I hear, Dad. So I'm like, Luke, what are you doing? And he just, like, when I run around the truck, he is freaked out. And he's like, I don't know. That's all he says. I'm like, come on. I grab him. We run to my office. Stuff's blowing around. You know, it's like Ron White's old joke. It's not that the wind's blowing. It's what the wind's blowing that could hurt you. Exactly. So we make it into the office. Everything's fine. Nothing happened. We were good. But man, it got really wild really quickly. Now, I personally didn't see the tornado. I only knew about it after the fact because everybody posted pictures. Yeah. But I know a lot of houses in Weatherford got damaged. Lots of people were without, over 10,000 people were without power for a day or so. Luckily... We were good. We didn't, we didn't lose, lose it. Yeah, yeah. We, we didn't lose any power. I had my crazy. Internet. We were good, but I know several people reached out to make sure we were okay. We are okay. Thanks for checking on us. Kim, are you okay? Yeah, it was a wild, wild thing sitting here when I was talking to you because that's when I was like, hey, look, it says it's going to be hailing, right, and all that stuff. But it never did. We never got hail. All of that for no hail. 
Yeah. Right. That was the whole thing. It is. It's been complete and total madness. But I like this time of year. I think it's when it's cool weather, it's green, it's beautiful. All of y'all that live where it's green all the time, I'm jealous. I'm very jealous because it'll burn off and be just crunchy around this place. But here's something I'm not jealous about. Uh, Mi amigo Lon, of course, he's doing well. Everything's good. Lon's feeling better. He had sent me this a little bit ago. And I think y'all need to hear it. I have another Glimmer Man encounter, except this time... This thing's clicking. I guess it's trying to make some sort of... Like in the movie. Yeah, it's some sort of of, of of like voice it's got or contact, whatever it is. But get a load of this here. It's from Sussex County, New Jersey. It says, I live in a very rural part of northern New Jersey in Sussex County. Now, behind my property and to the left of my house, well, it's all forest. Now, there are a few trails. And next door to me is protected wilderness area. This whole area is where you can't build on it. Nothing. So every once in a while, I would take my son and his little wagon, and we would set up on the clearing and have a little picnic. Well, we're playing a few feet up before you go into the woods. So we're just playing on this little clearing, and he starts to mimic the sounds that he hears. For instance, the neighbor's dog, birds, etc. Now, he mimicked the sounds around us like the squirrels running by and the chipmunks. Well, all of a sudden, I turned around to get him some fruit salad or whatever he was eating that day. And out of the corner of my eye, I see him just stop. And he's saying, Mom? Mom? But he's staring away, not looking at me. He's looking into the tree and he's pointing, but he's not blinking. I turned around and I asked, What do you see? Do you see a little bird? And then it hit me. There's no sounds. It's just like Luke. That's what Luke was doing. Yeah. He was just sitting there not, like he didn't know what to do. Completely froze, right? Yeah. But there's no sound. Nothing. There's no sound of anything. Says he starts walking into the woods, but the whole time he's looking up. He's still not looking where he's going and pointing up in the tree. The only movement I see besides my son are leaves rustling in the trees. Then I see it, and it's like heat rising up off the concrete on a sunny day. But it's in the tree, and it's like it's crouched down. One arm is out to the side, and its knees are bent. Immediately, I feel this thing's glare burning into me. Then I hear the clicking sound. As soon as his eyes snapped to me, my son looked at me and panicked. It literally had the shape of a humanoid. It's so hard to explain because it was human-like, but the way it was crouched reminded me of a praying mantis. My son is then mimicking an, a clicking sound that this thing was making. I grab my son and we run back to the house. All the food and everything is just left there in the woods where we were. I told my friend about what we experienced that evening, and he went back into the woods and gathered my belongings. He stayed in the woods for about an hour, telling me later that he did not see or hear anything unusual. That was six months ago. It's now February of 2023. I've read a few Glimmer Man reports from others online, and when I go outside during the day, I occasionally hear those same clicking sounds coming from the woods. Now at night, while in bed, I hear the faint clicking sounds emanating from the deep woods. I believe that this glimmer man is stalking us. I asked my neighbors if they heard the strange clicking sounds. They have not. Maybe I'm the only one allowed to hear them. I'll keep you updated, M. Now, Lon goes on to make a note here that Lon actually talked to M. And it says that find, he finds a clicking sound interesting since can't recall receiving previous reports where any of that's occurred. It's And goes on and Lon says it's very reminiscent of the sounds made by the predator that's cloaked in that, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Also in the movie Signs. Yeah. Remember when they're in the cornfields yep. and stuff, they're clicking. Making so, racket. you know, is, is M crazy or like we've talked about so many times, are there certain people that are perceptive to these things and others aren't? So. They are truly hearing these sounds. The neighbors aren't. They're like, no, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. Could be that. It, these encounters, because they're still so few and far between, it always just makes me feel like there are very few of these things. Yeah. Whatever they are. And it's almost it's almost like they're seen by accident by people that are tuned to it. Yeah, right. That's almost the way it it, it just feels. Oh, now, while they're why they have... You can't say they're nefarious, but crouching in a tree 
looks a little nefarious. You don't just climb a tree and then crouch and just watch. You people. don't. You I know, do. Oh, they don't. I go, I do it in the park all the time. Yeah, I, it, like you. You seen the movie <laughs> The Prophecy? Remember that old movie? Yeah. I wish I could sit on the back of a chair. Or like Vigo that. Mortensen. Just, remember, isn't he the? He's the devil. Yeah. Yeah, but I wish I could sit on the back of a chair like they do, like you crouch like a bird and something like that. That'd be pretty cool. But anyway, I don't know, man. Maybe it is. Maybe there's. They're always there, and they're always nefarious, and only a select few people can see them, or it's just maybe-, maybe Or is it not the few people that can see them, but they're being targeted? So maybe, whatever maybe. the predator thing is, is it it's trying, it's toying with you? Well, I will just say this. All of you that have ever sent in stories about the Glimmer Man and all the questions we've gotten, all that about that, I, I tell you one thing. If you've seen a Glimmer Man, if you've had any sort of encounter, you must be a great warrior- because the predator only went after like real great warriors. <laughs> That's true. Real tough things. So whatever it is, you are a great warrior. That's true. Remember, he only hunted somebody that was up to the challenge. Up to the challenge. Mm-hmm. That's right. So if you've seen it, you're up to the challenge. That's a good point. I never thought of that. You just don't want done it. Don't engage it. It's like he's inviting you to one on one combat. Yeah. I wouldn't accept at all. Check. None of that stuff because they put that crush stuff on him. And, <laughs> yeah. Look, he's tougher than you, but just just know that he's he's challenging you. Check this out. It says, I'm up north, and this is northern Michigan, by the way. And anybody who knows anything about Michigan, once you get past the center of Michigan, it's pretty much all wilderness up until you get into Canada. So my wife's family has a cabin, probably three hours north of where we live, in a place called Vanderbilt. It's a very small village. Their place is way out in the sticks. There's one street, and the street is maybe a mile long. And there are six houses on the whole street. So it's a small cabin and it sits maybe close to 70 acres, but it's all wooded, just totally wooded. So the next door neighbor is close, but then after that, you know, you're probably about a half a mile before you get to the next person. So we're up there on a couple of four wheelers. We go up there a lot. We take our four wheelers, take a bunch of gas and we ride like the whole family. So this one time, I don't know what in the hell possessed me to do this, but 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock up there is not like it is when you're in a city because there's no street lights, and you're totally in the forest. So I've ridden it. I've been going up there for nearly 15 to 20 years by the time this happened, and I've never seen anything. I've not even ever heard anything strange. There was no indication that anything sketchy at all would be going on. So I get my daughters, two of my daughters, So we jump on our four-wheelers, and my thing is like you take a main road down probably a mile, and then you turn on off onto a dirt road, then you take that road around. Then you're going to the woods, and there's these things called two tracks, and this and that. It's kind of a place where there's enough area for one vehicle or one four-wheeler, and then that's where you hit all the cool trails. So as we're on the main road, it's still pretty open because it's paved road, and it's two lanes, one going each way. It's pretty wide open and it's not dark, but the lights of the four-wheelers are on. So we go and make a left and we get on the dirt road I was talking about. This is a main kind of what you consider a main road back there. It's not technically inside the woods where the two-track is, so it's a place where you could drive a truck or a car if you really wanted to. So we make the first couple of turns going back there before even getting really into the woods. Finally, we get to the two-tracks. It's like it went from 5 to 6 o'clock to midnight immediately. I'm like, oh no, maybe this is a bad idea. I started to have this strange and funny feeling. So I stopped my daughters and I'm like, you know, maybe we should turn around. I usually allow both of them to go in front of me and turn around. And I, I said, I don't know, just I don't feel right. Maybe we should go right back to the cabin. So we're on like not even 5 to 10 minutes from the cabin at this point. We turn around and start heading back to the cabin. And as we head back, I'm in back and they're in front, both of them. I look to my left and here's what's really weird and kind of I don't know really how to describe this or how your mind works when you're seeing something that you just passed, but you can't believe what it is you're seeing. My mind, it couldn't process it. I looked over and the only thing I can think of is just two people on horses because that's the only thing my mind could process. They were human-like figures, and they were tall. So tall that they would have to be someone sitting on top of a horse. That's the first thing my mind processed, and they're just standing still, not moving one muscle. 
and there's two of them. One is clearly taller than the other, by almost a full foot. So I was just looking at them. I don't see the back part of the horses at all, but their hair is so long like a horse's mane, but it's all over their body. They weren't sitting on horses. These things were just standing there. I started to get freaked out because way back here, it's dark, and is my mind playing tricks on me? So I just kept going. We zoom back to the cabin, and it's probably 10 p.m. Fifteen relatives were there. They're all sitting around by a fire outside, drinking, telling stories, having a good time. You know, we got like five dogs out there because it's three to four different families. I think I had two dogs at the time. So we get back, and I'm sitting around and, of course, telling the story about how that was the worst idea ever because we turned two corners and we were in complete darkness and how I would never want to do anything like that stupid again. We're sitting around, and my back is to the cabin, and I'm facing the woods. All of a sudden, all of the dogs started to go completely bonkers. They're running around in circles, urinating on themselves and barking. I mean barking, but at the same time I could tell they were totally scared. No bark of aggression at all. I mean absolutely, totally, they were going crazy. Even everybody around was like wondering, what are they doing? Why are they acting like this? They just wouldn't stop. I was like, what the heck is going on? And my dog, rest in peace, Nala, she's right next to me, but she's just going in circles, going and turning in circles. And I'm like, what's wrong? Relax, relax. So I look straight ahead in the woods and what I see, and this is how I process it. I see glowing yellow eyes, two sets of eyes. One was probably 11 feet tall. The other one was probably 12 feet tall. And the only reference I have is I coach basketball. I've coached basketball for 20 years, so I know what 10 feet looks like. And I know one was definitely 11 feet and the other one was 12 feet. So I said to myself, this must be two owls in the trees. I said, wow, owls. Their eyes would be like, you know, closer together, though, if it was an owl. These are pretty far apart. And so I just started to look and I saw them blink. I see one of the sets of eyes blink, and then it dawns on me what the dogs are afraid of and what they saw, and I believe that those same two Sasquatch that I had seen earlier had followed me back to the cabin. Those two had covered the distance in roughly a few minutes to get where they are now. They were staying by our fire. Everyone else was just standing there watching, and the dogs were still going berserk. So we gathered them up and we went into the cabin and we didn't come out the rest of the night. The next day, I got up and looked around for tracks or any kind of sign, but I didn't see anything. What do you guys think? Thanks, Glenn. Well, Glenn, <clears throat> I mean, you saw something, or not just you, but your family members, or at least some of them did. The dogs definitely saw or smelled 100%. something. Yeah. Right? You hear about this all the time. I'm um, glad they got reactions out of the animals. Yeah. That's yeah. always one of those deals, right? Like, you're like, I know I'm not going crazy if the animal sees it too. Yeah, exactly. You know, they always point that out as like, did you see it by yourself? Did you and your friends see it? I'm like, I could understand maybe how you and your buddy might have some crazy thing happen, right? But a, a whole family and then it, and then pets? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. You know, and it's getting time, it's close to the time of the year where people are going to be doing a lot of camping and yeah. stuff. So I don't know why I always get these stories right around time I to take my family out camping. Right, I'm right? ready to go to the woods and that's going to get wild. You don't think I'm going to think about that when we're sitting around the fire? Of course I am. If right? not, I'm going to text it and bring it up. Please don't. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, let's take a break. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about a long and treacherous journey. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
On April 16, 1846, nine covered wagons left Springfield, Illinois, on the 2,500-mile journey to California and what would become one of the greatest tragedies in the history of westward migration. The originator of this group was a man named James Fraser Reed, an Illinois businessman eager to build a greater fortune in the rich land of California. Reed also hoped that his wife, Margaret, who suffered from terrible headaches, might improve in the coastal climate. Reed had recently read the book, The Immigrants, Guide to Oregon and California, by Lansford W. Hastings, who advertised a new shortcut across the Great Basin. This new route enticed travelers by advertising that it would save the pioneers 350 to 400 miles on easy terrain. However, what was not known by Reed was that the Hastings route had never actually been tested. Written by Hastings, who had visions of building an empire at Sutter's Fort, now modern-day Sacramento, it was this falsified information that would lead to the doom of the Donner Party. Reed soon found others seeking adventure and fortune in the vast West, including the Donner family, the Graves, the Breens, the Murphys, the Eddies, the McCutcheons, the Kessbergs, and the Wolffingers, as well as seven Teamsters and a number of bachelors. The initial group included 32 men, women, and children. With James and Margaret Reed, with their four children, Virginia, Patty, James, and Thomas, as well as Margaret's 70-year-old mother, Sarah Keyes, and two hired servants, they headed out. Though Sarah Keyes was so sick with the consumption that she could barely walk, she was unwilling to be separated from her only daughter. James Reed was determined his family would not suffer on the long journey, as his wagon was an extravagant, two-story affair with a built-in iron stove, spring-cushioned seats, and bunks for sleeping. Taking eight oxen to pull these luxurious wagons, Reed's 12-year-old daughter Virginia dubbed it the Pioneer Palace Car. In nine brand new wagons, the group estimated the trip would take four months to cross the plains, deserts, mountain ranges, and rivers in their quest for California. Their first destination was Independence, Missouri, which was the main jumping off point for the Oregon and California trails. Also in the group were the families of George and Jacob Donner. George Donner was a successful 62-year-old farmer who had migrated five times before settling in Springfield, Illinois. Along with his brother Jacob, obviously adventurous, the brothers decided to make one last trip to California, which unfortunately would be their last. With George were his third wife, Tamzine, their three children, Francis, Georgia, and Eliza, and George's two daughters from a previous marriage, Elitha and Leanna. Jacob Donner and his wife Elizabeth brought their five children, George, Mary, Isaac, Samuel, and Louis, as well as Miss Donner's two children from a previous marriage, Solomon and William Hook. Also, along with them were two Teamsters, Noah James and Samuel Shoemaker, as well as a friend named John Denton. In the bottom of Jacob Donner's saddlebag was a copy of Lansford's Immigrant's Guide, and with its tantalizing talk of a faster route to the Promised Land. Ironically, on the very day that the Illinois party started west from Springfield, Lansford Hastings himself prepared to head east from California to see what the shortcut he had written about was really like. The wagon train reached Independence, Missouri about three weeks later, where they were resupplied. The next day, May 12, 1846, they headed west again in the middle of a thunderstorm. 
A week later, they joined a large wagon train, captained by Colonel William H. Russell, that was camped on Indian Creek, about 100 miles west of Independence. Along the entire journey, others would join the group until its size numbered now 87. On May 25th, the train was held for several days by high water at the Big Blue River, near present-day Marysville, Kansas. It was here that the train would experience its first death, when Sarah Keyes died and was buried next to the river. We pray to thee, our God, this day for the blessings you provide. But from ashes to ashes and from dust to dust, so it must be. But keep this woman, O King of Kings, beneath thy almighty wings. O God, the spirit of all our joys, the cause of our delight. After building ferries to cross the water, the party was on their way again, following the Platte River for the next month. Along the way, William Russell resigned as the captain of the wagon train, and the position was assumed by a man named William Boggs. Encountering few problems along the trail, the pioneers reached Fort Laramie just one week behind schedule on June 27, 1846. At Fort Laramie, James Reed ran into an old friend from Illinois by the name of James Clyman, who had just traveled the new route eastwardly with Lansford Hastings. Clyman advised Reed not to take the Hastings route, stating that the road was barely passable on foot and would be impossible with wagons. Also, warning him of the Great Desert and the Sierra Nevadas, though he strongly suggested that the party take the regular wagon trail rather than this new false route, Reed would later ignore his warning in an attempt to reach their destination more quickly. Joined by other wagons in Fort Laramie, the pioneers were met by a man carrying a letter from Lansford W. Hastings at the Continental Divide on July 11th. The letter stated that Hastings would meet the immigrants at Fort Bridger and lead them on his cutoff, which passed south of the Great Salt Lake, instead of detouring northwest via Fort Hall, which is present-day Pocatello, Idaho. The letter successfully allayed any fears that the party might have regarding the Hastings cutoff. On July 19th, the wagon train arrived at the Little Sandy River in present-day Wyoming, where the trail parted into two routes, the northerly known route and the untested Hastings cutoff. Here, the train split, with the majority of the large caravan taking the safer route. The group preferring the Hastings route elected George Donner as their captain and soon began the southerly route, reaching Fort Bridger on July 28th. However, upon their arrival at Fort Bridger, no word of Lansford Hastings was around. There was no sign. Only a note left with other immigrants resting at the fort. The note indicated that Hastings had left with another group and that later travelers should follow and catch up. Jim Bridger and his partner, Luis Vasquez, assured the Donner Party that the Hastings cutoff was a good route. Satisfied, the immigrants rested for a few days at the fort, making repairs to their wagons and preparing for the rest of what they thought would be a seven-week-long journey. On July 31st, the party left Fort Bridger, joined by the McCutcheon family. The group now numbered 74 people in 20 wagons, and for the first week, they made good progress, around 10 to 12 miles per day. On August 6th, the party reached the Weber River after having passed through Echo Canyon. Here they came to a halt when they found a note from Hastings advising them not to follow him down Weber Canyon, as it was virtually impassable, but rather to take another trail through the Salt Basin. While the party camped near modern-day Hennifer, Utah, James Reed, along with two other men, forged ahead on horses to catch up with Hastings. Finding the party 
at the south shore of the Great Salt Lake. Hastings accompanied Reed partway back to the point to point out a new route, which he said would take them about one week to travel. In the meantime, the Graves family caught up with the Donner Party, which now numbered 87 people in 23 wagons. Taking a vote among the party members, the group decided to try the new trail rather than backtracking back to Fort Bridger. On August 11, the wagon train began the arduous journey through the Wasatch Mountains, clearing trees and other obstructions along the new path of their journey. In the beginning, the wagon train was lucky to make even two miles per day, taking six days just to travel eight miles. Along the way, they discovered that some of their wagons would have to be abandoned before long. Morale began to sink and the pioneers began to adamantly blame Lansford Hastings. By the time they reached the shore, they also blamed James Reed. On August 25th, the caravan lost another member, one Luke Holleran, who died of consumption, near present-day Grantsville, Utah. About this time, fear began to set in as provisions were starting to run low, and time was against them. In the 21 days since reaching the Weber River, they had only moved just 36 miles. Five days later, on August 30th, the group began to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert, believing the trek would take only two days, according to Hastings. However, what they didn't know was that the desert sand was moist and deep, and their wagons quickly got bogged down, severely slowing their progress. On the third day in the desert, their water supply was nearly exhausted, and some of Reed's oxen ran away. When they finally reached the end of the grueling desert five days later, on September 4th, the immigrants rested near the base of Pilot Peak for several days. On their 80-mile journey through the Salt Lake Desert, they had lost a total of 32 oxen. Reed was forced to abandon two of his wagons, and the Donners, as well as a man named Louis Kessberg, lost one wagon each. On the far side of the desert, an inventory of food was taken and found to be less than adequate for the 600-mile trek still ahead. Ominously, snow powdered the mountain peaks that very night. They reached the Humboldt River on September 26th. Realizing that the difficult journey through the mountains and the desert had depleted their supplies, two of the young men traveling with the party William McCutcheon and Charles Stanton were sent ahead to Souter's Fort, California, to bring back supplies. From September 10th through the 25th, the party followed the trail into Nevada, around the Ruby Mountains, finally reaching the Humboldt River on September 26th. It was here that the new trail met up with Hastings' original path. Having traveled an extra 125 miles through the strenuous mountain terrain and dry desert, the disillusioned party's resentment of Hastings and ultimately Reed was increased tremendously. The Donner Party soon reached the junction with the California Trail, about seven miles west of present-day Elko, Nevada, and spent the next two weeks traveling along the Humboldt River. As the disillusionment of the party increased, tempers began to flare in the group. On October 5th, at Iron Point, two wagons became entangled, and John Snyder, a teamster of one of the wagons, began to whip his oxen. Infuriated by the teamster's treatment of the oxen, James Reed ordered the man to stop, and when he wouldn't, Reed grabbed his knife and stabbed the teamster in the stomach, killing him. The Donner Party wasted no time in administering their own justice. Though member Louis Kessberg favored hanging... James Reed, the group instead voted to banish him. Leaving his family, Reed was last seen riding off into the west with a man named Walter Heron. The Donner Party continued to travel along the Humboldt River, with the remaining draft animals exhausted. To spare the animals, everyone who could walked. Two days after the Snyder killing, on October 7th, Louis Kessberg turned out a Belgian man named Hardcoop, 
who had been traveling with him. The old man, who couldn't keep up with the rest of the party, with his severely swollen feet, began to knock on the other wagon doors, but no one would let him in. Please! I won't be any trouble. I can't walk. Please! For the love of God, please let me in. He was last seen, sitting under a large sagebrush, completely exhausted, unable to walk, worn out, and was left there to die. The terrible ordeals of the caravan continued to mount, when on October 12th, their oxen were attacked by Paiute Indians, killing 21 of them with poison-tipped arrows, further depleting the draft animals they had. Continuing to encounter multiple obstacles, on October 16th, they reached the gateway to the Sierra Nevada on the Truckee River, almost completely depleted of food supplies. Miraculously, just three days later on October 19th, one of the men the party had sent on to Fort Souter, Charles Stanton, returned laden with seven mules loaded with beef and flour, two Indian guides, and news of a clear but difficult path through the Sierra Nevada. Stanton's partner, William McCutcheon, had fallen ill and remained at the fort. The caravan camped for five days, 50 miles from the summit, resting their oxen for this final push. The decision to delay their departure was yet one more of many that would lead to their tragedy. October 28th, an exhausted James Reed arrived at Souter's Fort, where he met William McCutcheon, now recovered, and the two men began preparations to go back for their families. In the meantime, while the wagon train continued to the base of, of the summit, George Donner's wagon axle broke, and he fell behind the rest of the party. Twenty-two people, consisting of the Donner family and their hired men, stayed behind while the wagon was repaired. Unfortunately, while cutting timber for a new axle, a chisel slipped and Donner cut his hand badly, causing the group to fall further behind. As the rest of the party continued to what is now known as Donner's Lake, snow began to fall. Stanton and the two Indians who were traveling ahead made it as far as the summit but could not go any further. Hopelessness. Hopeless they retraced their steps, where five feet of new snow had already fallen. With the Sierra Pass just 12 miles beyond, the wagon train, after attempting to make the pass through the heavy snow, finally retreated to the eastern end of the lake, where level ground and timber was abundant. At the lake stood one existing cabin, and realizing they were stranded, the group built two more cabins, sheltering 59 people, in hopes that the early snow would melt allowing them to continue their travels. The 22 people, with the Donners, were about six miles behind at Alder Creek. Hastily, as the snow continued, the party built three shelters from tents, quilts, buffalo robes, and brush to protect themselves from the harsh conditions. At Donner Lake, two more attempts were made to get over the pass in 20 feet of snow, until they finally realized they were snowbound for the entire winter. More small cabins were constructed, many of which were shared by more than one family. The weather and their hopes were not to improve. Over the next four months, the remaining men, women, and children would huddle together in cabins, makeshift lean-tos, and tents. Meanwhile, Reed and McCutcheon had headed back up into the mountains attempting to rescue their stranded companions. Two days after they started out, it began to rain. As the elevation increased, the rain turned to snow, and 12 miles from the summit, the pair could go no further. Cacheting their provisions in Bear Valley, they returned to Souter's Fort, hoping to recruit more men and supplies for the rescue. However, the Mexican War had drawn away the able-bodied men, forcing any further rescue attempts to wait. Not knowing how many cattle the immigrants had lost, the men believed that the party would have enough meat to last them at least a couple of months. On Thanksgiving, it began to snow again, 
and the pioneers at Donner Lake killed the last of their oxen for food on November 29th. The very next day, five more feet of snow fell, and they knew that any plans for a departure were dashed. Many of their animals, including Suter's mules, had wandered off into the storms, and their bodies were now lost under the snow. A few days later, their last few cattle were slaughtered for food, and the party began eating boiled hides, twigs, bones, and even bark. Some of the men tried to hunt with little success. And on December 15th, Bayless Williams died of malnutrition, and the group realized that something had to be done before they all died. The next day, five men, nine women, and one child departed on snowshoes for the summit, determined to travel the hundred miles to Suter's Fort. However, with only meager rations and already weak from hunger, the group faced a challenging ordeal. On the sixth day, Their food ran out, and for the next three days, no one ate while they traveled through grueling high winds and freezing weather. One member of the party, Charles Stanton, snow blind and exhausted, was unable to keep up with the rest of the party, and they told him to go on. He never rejoined the group. A few days later, the party was caught in a blizzard and had great difficulty getting and keeping a fire lit. Antonio, Patrick Dolan, Franklin Graves and Lemuel Murphy soon died, and in desperation, the others resorted to cannibalism. Living off the bodies of those that died along the path to Suter's Fort, the snowshoeing survivors were reduced to seven by the time they reached safety on the western side of the mountains on January 19, 1847. Only two of the ten men survived, including William Eddy and William Foster. But all five women lived through the journey. Of the eight dead, seven had been cannibalized. Immediately messages were dispatched to neighboring settlements as area residents rallied to save the rest of the Donner Party. On February 5th, the first relief party of seven men left Johnson's ranch, and the second, headed by James Reed, left two days later. On February 19th, The first party reached the lake, finding what appeared to be a deserted camp, until the ghostly figure of a woman appeared. Twelve of the immigrants were dead, and of the forty-eight remaining, many had gone crazy or were barely clinging to life. However, the nightmare was by no means over. Not everyone could be taken out at one time, and since no pack animals could be brought in, few food supplies were brought in. The first relief party soon left with 23 refugees, but during the party's travels back to Suter's Fort, two more children died. En route, down the mountains, the first relief party met the second relief party coming the opposite way, and the Reed family was reunited after five months. On March 1st, the second relief party finally arrived at the lake, finding grisly evidence of cannibalism. The next day, they arrived at Alder Creek to find that the Donners had also resorted to cannibalism. On March 3rd, Reed left the camp with 17 of the starving immigrants, but just two days later, they were caught in another blizzard. When it cleared, Isaac Donner had died and most of the refugees were too weak to travel. Reed and another rescuer, Hiram Miller, took three of the refugees with them hoping to find food they had stored on the way up. The rest of the pioneers stayed at what would become known as Starved Camp. On March 12th, the third relief led by William Eddy and William Foster reached Starved Camp, where Miss Graves and her son Franklin had also died. The three bodies, including that of Isaac Donner, had been cannibalized. The next day, they arrived at the lake to find that both of their sons had died. On March 14th, They arrived at the Alder Creek camp to find George Donner was dying from an infection in the hand that he had injured months before. His wife, Tamzine, though in comparatively good health, 
refused to leave him, sending her three little girls without her. The relief party soon departed with four more members of the party, leaving those who were too weak to travel. Two rescuers, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau and Nicholas Clark, were left behind to care for the Donners, but soon abandoned them to catch up with the relief party. A fourth rescue party set out in late March, but were soon stranded in a blinding snowstorm for several days. On April 17th, the relief party reached the camps to find only Louis Kessberg alive among the mutilated remains of his former companions. Kessberg was the last member of the Donner Party to arrive at Souter's Fort on April 29th. It took two months and four relief parties to rescue the entire surviving Donner Party. In the Donner Party tragedy, two-thirds of the men in the party perished, while two-thirds of the women and children lived. Forty-one individuals died, and forty-six survived. In the end, five had died before reaching the mountains. Thirty-five perished either at the mountain camps or trying to cross the mountains, and one died just after reaching the valley. Many of those who survived lost toes due to frostbite. The story of the Donner tragedy quickly spread across the country, Newspapers printed letters and diaries and accused the travelers of bad conduct, cannibalism, and even murder. The surviving members had differing viewpoints, biases, and recollections as to what actually happened and was never extremely clear. Some blamed the power-hungry Lansford W. Hastings for the tragedy, while others blamed James Reed for not heeding Kleiman's warnings about the deadly route. After the publicity, immigration to California fell off sharply, and Hastings' cutoff was all but abandoned. Then, in January 1848, gold was discovered at John Souter's Mill in Coloma, and gold-hungry travelers began to rush out west once again. By late 1849, more than 100,000 people had come to California in search of gold near the streams and canyons where the Donner Party had suffered. Donner Lake, named for the party, is today a popular mountain resort near Truckee, California, and the Donner Camp has been designated as a National Historic Landmark. The Donner Camp has been the site of many archaeological excavations. back with expanded perspectives you know we've got it so easy and i know everybody and look i'm guilty of it too it's because the it's the times we live in you think you have it really bad but then you go back just a couple hundred generations and you get these old pioneers and stuff that are trekking across the united states with a stagecoach by horse you want to talk about hard times not just is the weather tough you got to put up with all the natives trying to kill you. You got to put up a disease. You got to make sure outlaws. you have food. It's not like you can just stop at a Walmart. Yeah, outlaws. It's, it's nonstop debauchery. Like, you've got to fend for yourself start to finish. It's amazing that they even did it. It is. It really is. I mean, it's because they were a different type of people. Our generation, I don't think, could, could do it. It's so wild to me. My The first, well, here's the thing I never thought about, and I've talked about it some. Being out on the plains or on the prairies or just travel, any of that, even in the mountainous area, anywhere back then, and being hit with a storm like those tornadoes. Imagine being on the plains of Kansas 
Jeez. in a wagon train and you've never you've you've come over from Europe and you've never even seen you don't even know what a tornado is. It's yeah. No. And then all of a sudden there is this giant monster in the sky and here it comes and whatever it touches, it destroys. Right. Like it just scatters everything for miles. Yeah. Say it doesn't kill you, but it just totally wrecks your stuff like that's it. That's all your provisions. You're dead. It, you got nothing. It did kill you. It just didn't kill you right then. It just killed you in the long game. Uh, I mean, right? It's, all of that stuff, it always makes me surprised at how far we got. How did they do it? They crossed those Rocky Mountains. Every time I go oh. skiing and stuff, I'm like, you imagine people going up and around this stuff? And not just here, but the further you go back to the the stones on the people that decided to be sailors and take voyages onto the sea on just like log rafts just because it was there. And right? I know. like, well, I watched that star and that star hasn't moved in a while. So, you know what? I'm going to point the nose of my ship towards that star and I'm just going to go out in the ocean and see what's on the other side of the horizon. It is oh. impressive. Oh, man. You know, if uh, even if you're not a big fan of the television series Yellowstone, you could watch 1883 by itself. It's fantastic. And it's about that very thing. People traveling from Fort Worth, what, all the way up to Montana and stuff. Do you let me and ask you this talking about that right now? If within the next five years, if all of a sudden, let's say that we made in unimaginable leaps in technology that allowed us now to ease, let's say there was still some work to it, but the easeability to travel the stars, like you, I'm talking like we had the ability to safely travel to Mars in two hours. Would you get involved if they started putting it out there? And I mean, it went like wildfire to like everybody was building them. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it was one yeah. of those open source information and people could build them. And like it was like you see in the movies, like the, would you explore the universe given the chance? Yeah, I think so. Right. Would you just point it like we're talking about, like they did back in the day on the ocean? Would you just point the nose into the darkness and go, let's just go and see where we can end up? I don't think I would do that. But if we could travel to Mars easily, say. Safely and easily, like you said, in two hours, I would definitely go to Mars. So what you're saying is, just like you would drive to Waco to play disc golf, you would just fly to Mars, but you wouldn't go explore the universe. Oh, no, no. no. (laughs) Because I think there's a lot of bad stuff that we don't even know exists. I'd like to keep it that way. I'm good, right? Here's the thing. Do you not want to know they exist, or do you not want them to know you exist? I don't want them to know I exist. That's I me. know they exist. I'm always like, quit sending signals, right, like we talk about. Don't let every, don't just turn everything off. Let's just catch it by accident. Don't call it down here. We don't know what will show up. Well, and I recently, you know, we were talking about a couple episodes ago about us shooting down three identified objects yeah. in a balloon. Apparently, we're not the only ones. Apparently, Russia and China has been shooting stuff down, too. So what is going on? I don't know. What are they? It's unsettling. Speaking of what's going on, check this out. This person writes in and says, my story starts about 25 years ago. Word. I was 17 years old at the time. I used to take a shortcut through the woods, Freeport, Long Island in New York. And heading towards the shortcut, I'd say maybe around 12 blocks, I had to go through like a marshy swamp area about 100 yards in and it's dark. It's in the back of an old railroad station, not lit very well. You could barely see. You could maybe see 20 or 30 yards, but that's about it. About 100 yards in there, I had to follow a trail along a fence. I had to sit down to smoke a cigarette. I was just sitting there, 17 years old, and I'm not scared of much, especially growing up in New York. All kinds of surprises until after this experience. So I'm out near the marsh. I'm sitting down out near the marsh, and I hear some dog tags, you know, clanking together. I didn't think much of it. There are a lot of dogs out there goofing off. As I sat there, the chains just started coming closer. The tags were clinking and clanking and also were coming closer. So I'm thinking that a dog is on its way. No big deal. No need for alarm. As my ears, I used mostly because I couldn't really see. To my left was a creek that came out of a pipe. It came from under the property. It wrapped around in front of me about 10 or 12 yards to drop down into a creek. The creek's about another 10 yards, and there's a sandbank on the other side. Then there's some type of marshy, small trees, and you could see maybe 10 or 20 yards past the creek. Those clanking sounds were coming closer and closer still. My ears are telling me that it should be visible any second. It should be coming into my range, and I still at this time thought it was a dog. I'm expecting to hear a little critter, you know, coming through the grass and leaves and whatnot. 
and I hear two footsteps. I, I hear something with two footsteps. Thump, thump. And it's coming towards me. Not a French poodle, not a German shepherd. Two distinct footsteps coming through, as you can hear the grass and the walking, and the dog chains are still clinking and clanging. That's about when my alarm bells started to go off. I'm thinking, okay, this could be a problem. This isn't what I thought it would be. There's no way you can think this is anything but a problem. Something's wrong, and my ears are telling me that I ought to be able to see this thing by now. It should be right on the other side of the creek, but I don't see anything. This kind of just dragged on for about 20 minutes. It didn't just walk up. I'm thinking, oh crap, maybe it's a serial killer. I'm thinking, I don't know, something bad is going to happen. And I'm looking around trying to figure, should I go back to the right or should I go to the left? And I'm in New York, so it's not always a friendly place. And I'm out in the middle of the swamp. You can't see very good. To get to the back street of the neighborhood I was heading to, I had to make a left about 10 yards or so, go across the pipe to the right and go another 25 yards, then up the side of a hill. That'll bring me to a dead-end street, straight up there to the neighborhood, and I have about 30 more blocks to get to my house, and the trail on the other side went away from the creek. So whatever would have been done there on that bank would have had a 30-yard trip to where it was, and I had a 30-yard trip to where it was. So I got up and I bolted. I figured I could beat it. I hang to the left, run to the right, and I'm in a full sprint. I'm the athletic type. I'm about 6'2". And just where I got to the point where I would go up this hill, a 10 or 12 foot shadow with red beady eyes stepped up from the bank and was just standing right in my path. 10 or 12 feet. It was huge. It had horns. I froze. I was like... Are you kidding me? I could see an outline. It was dark, as dark could be. All you could see was the outline, though. Looking into this creature, it was as dark as night. It had red, beady eyes. Not just glowing eyes, but red, beady eyes. I froze. I was stuck, and I don't know how long I was there. I stood there contemplating some kind of communication coming at me. Like step into me or something. I don't know. But I didn't want to touch this thing. What any red-blooded 17-year-old do at this point and in this situation, I turned around and I ran. And I ran. And I didn't stop running. I ran all the way home. This was like 40 blocks. This was like two miles. I came home sweating, huffing. My parents kind of looked at me odd. I was well-raised, you know. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. I was a Catholic boy. I was almost in shock. I couldn't explain to them what, I, what had just happened. I didn't dare. They would have committed me. They would have sent me to a private school or something. I only told one person in my life. I grew up in Catholic schools, and I tried to tell my priest what I saw. It was just a definition of something evil. It wasn't until later I heard your show, and you were talking about shadow beings. And I thought this whole time that I was the only one who've seen one of these. But apparently, a lot of people have seen them. I've never seen it again, and I don't dare to. Thanks for all you do, Gentry. <clears throat> Crazy. Another shadow being. Another one. With horns and beady, beady eyes, not glowing eyes. Look, I don't like, the, look, it's not like shadow beings aren't already creepy enough, but now you start giving them horns and beady eyes, right? Like, well, ee. And I like how you Ooh. said, or, or she, how they said that they had the impression that it wanted him to walk into it. So, so what, what? It could yeah. absorb it was his. like it was calling him to. Absorb to his the, soul, take him to another plane. Yeah. Like what is going on? I don't yeah. know. It's like it's summoning. Well, there's a lot of that stuff, though, that we see that it's almost where people talk about being drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole story with the puck wedgie and stuff is it's Ugh. trying to lure you into the woods. Still, it's all one and the same. Man, right? man thanks for all the, the unnerving things today, Brad. I appreciate it. No. All the unnerving camping stories and all that. I really, I really like that. What, uh, what do you got planned for your week? Uh, my daughter is coming home. So we're going to do a bunch of stuff and uh, been helping my son a bunch. We've been doing a whole bunch of stuff. And we have a whole bunch of stuff helping him through his company and helping him at one of his uh, properties, rental properties. So I gotcha. that's what we'll be doing. Right on, right on. Yes, spring break's uh, coming up, so the kids will be out of school and all that. Oh, so, oh and boy. I'm, I'm running my first ever true D&D &D campaign. I'm running a little one-shot 
for you and little Fizzy. Oh, boy, is he ready because he wants to go see the movie, and I told him, you can't go see the movie till you at least play because he has no yeah. concept. Yeah. He knows all the monsters, <clears throat> but he doesn't know how the mechanics work, right? Because he just likes to look at the monsters, compendium, all that stuff. Well, heck, I don't know how the mechanics work. Look at me trying yeah, right? to play. Like, trying I'm to figure terrible, it out. right? <laughs> right. Well, let's not forget about our sponsor, HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com right now, slash expanded65, and use the promo code 65 to get 65% off plus free shipping. That Just go to HelloFresh.com slash expanded65 and use the code expanded65. Uh, if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, please send them in expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 888-393-2783. That's 888-393-BRUD. Hope everybody out there has a great week. Till next time, I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.